Generally, movies are pretty harmless forms of escapist entertainment. But every so often, a film will get its hooks into reality and completely screw over a living, breathing person. A movie can ruin an actor's or filmmaker's career, or in extreme cases, cause the death of people not even involved with the film. The following movies touch some very real lives, and things didn't end well for anyone involved. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs as it was one of the first animated feature films ever made, you'd think Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs would have turned its leading lady, Adriana Casalotti, into a major star. After all, the film was a big hit and a cinematic landmark, but despite playing in one of the most beloved movies ever made, Casalotti largely vanished from the Tinseltown scene after working on the Disney film. According to some theories, Walt Disney refused to let Casalotti use her voice in any other program keeping her under a tight contract so that no one would know the secret voice behind the princess. <laughs> However, Disney didn't start contracting actors until 1946, so that theory is unlikely. Instead, it seems that Casalotti's own talent betrayed her. Disney himself said that he couldn't cast her again because her voice was just too easy to identify, while still refusing to let her work elsewhere. Add that to the fact that she was never credited on the original film until it was too late, and Casalotti was left with a slumbering career. Peeping Tom Once upon a time, Michael Powell directed some of the greatest films of English cinema, including Black Narcissus and The Red Shoes. But everything changed in 1960, when Powell directed Peeping Tom, a wild departure from his previous work. Peeping Tom focuses on a shy, repressed young photographer who gets his kicks by murdering women with a blade attached to his camera tripod. While tame by today's standards, audiences at the time were absolutely shocked. Peeping Tom deals with all kinds of uncomfortable topics, from child abuse to pornography. British critics lost their minds, labeling the film as perverted and beastly. Powell was exiled from the British film industry and could only make movies in other countries, none of which lived up to his old classics. As a result, the man and his movie faded into obscurity until 1979, when Martin Scorsese re-released the film. These days, Peeping Tom is considered one of Powell's best films, and the British Film Institute labeled it the 78th greatest British film ever. But there's no denying this 1960 flick completely killed Powell's career. Le Mans Steve McQueen wanted to make the greatest racing movie ever. Unfortunately, things didn't pan out the way McQueen had hoped when he was filming Le Mans. The film's original director, John Sturgis, had his own vision for the film and eventually left the project over creative differences. By the end, the movie had gone so far over budget that McQueen was forced to give up his salary, and the making of Le Mans would ultimately cause his company, Solar Productions, to collapse. But at the end of the day, at least McQueen made it out of Le Mans in one piece. The same can't be said for David Piper. A Formula One racer working on the film, Piper was driving a Porsche 917 for a scene and lost control of the car, severely injuring his leg. The wound became infected, and doctors were forced to partially amputate. I was making this film about Le Mans, and I had a crash in a 917, and I had to have my leg amputated. The injury effectively ended his racing career, and it was all for a movie that's largely been forgotten by most moviegoers. The Message in 1977, director Mustafa Akkad released The Message, a desert epic in the vein of Lawrence of Arabia. Only, instead of focusing on an English adventurer, the film tells the story of the Prophet Muhammad and the rise of Islam. True, you're not supposed to actually depict Muhammad, but Akkad got around this by having actors speak directly at the audience, as if the camera itself was the Prophet. But despite Akkad's attempts at making a peaceful, inoffensive film, quite a few people took his message the wrong way. Several countries banned the film, but even worse, someone decided to stage a protest, with swords and shotguns. Hamas Abdul Khalis and a group of 11 took over multiple buildings in Washington, D.C. and claimed 149 hostages. Tragically, this attack wasn't without casualties. When the group stormed the district building, Khalis and his group shot and murdered security guard Matt Cantrell and a reporter named Maurice Williams. Fortunately, the rest of the hostages were freed 39 hours later, and Khalis was sentenced to life in prison, where he died in 2003. The Goonies it's safe to say that the people who love The Goonies really, really love it. In fact, fans from as far away as Europe have made the pilgrimage to Astoria, Oregon to see The Goonies' house for themselves. You know the one. It's two stories tall, has cool stuff in the attic, and you have to do the truffle shuffle to get inside. <laughs>
But while the Astoria house has brought joy to a lot of fans, not everyone is so happy with the home's popularity. Sandy Preston bought the house in 2001, and at first, she was totally cool with fans showing up to take photos. However, all that changed in 2015, when she wrapped her house with blue tarps and set out signs saying her home was now off-limits to the public. So what prompted such a radical change? In recent years, the amount of tourists coming to see the house was on the rise. Shockingly, during the summer of 2015, up to 1,500 people dropped by her home every single day. While some were on their best behavior, many of these fans didn't care all that much about manners. People show up before dawn or well after dark, leaving beer bottles, cigarette butts, and, we'll say, presents from their pets. Eventually, it was all just too much for Preston, who decided it was time to take her house back. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love, too.